another week. Time for another question show. As always, your questions, my answers, wherever you are on the YouTube channel or anywhere, just like write a question about whether one of the topics we just talked about or just whatever you've heard about in the news or something about space that's bothering you. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. Uh, when you're watching this, I'll be in Iceland. So uh, hopefully we're going to record an episode, QA episode with Paul Sutter live with me and we'll have that be a future question show so hopefully that'll happen next week all right let's get into the questions jimmy and warren i'm glad you could admit you were wrong i like your channel but a lot of times you come off as smug and talk about scientific theories today as if they're scientific laws and in my personal opinion a lot of theories of today will be revised or replaced with more accurate ones as more data is collected I think that was in relation to me sort of understanding more about the search for biosignatures around other worlds. And I think the thing that's important is to say that, that the whole point about science is that it is open-minded and it changes its position as more evidence is accumulated. That is the way science works. And so, and, and that is its great benefit. That is the thing that science does that is better than any other method of knowing. Right? When you think about the other methods of knowing, be it spirituality or be it um, philosophy or things like that, in general, they are fairly closed-minded. A lot of the religion, things like that, are, are basing their knowledge about the universe on what was written in a book. And, and the book is right no matter what observations get made. And the whole point about science is that, it, is that scientists, when done right, science when done right, is about this constant accumulation of knowledge about doing data, making sure that the data that you're, that you're accumulating is independently veri verifiable, about attempting to find reasons why the theory that you have about the universe is wrong, and then looking for ways to overturn your own theory. That's how science works. Scientists can't wait to be told that they're wrong because it shows them one more thing that you know moves them one step further to starting to really kind of understand what's going on and you know some things we're in the middle of a totally unknown situation like you know the first stages of the big bang or why was there more an matter than antimatter in the universe or what is consciousness or why do we sleep there's all these questions that we don't know while other things are more settled science right um why does the moon go around the earth or or um you know, how can we communicate vast distances at the speed of light using electrons you know when you think about the internet think about the the communications this the, you're watching this right now on a device that is the accumulation of an enormous amount of science because scientists were attempting every time to move forward and try to understand and test out different theories and throw out hypotheses and change their mind when they find out so so i think that when you know, it's like whenever I say anything, you should be running in your mind to the best of our understanding right now. This is what the bulk of the evidence seems to say. And as soon as new evidence comes in that contradicts this theory, everyone will throw out this theory and move to the next theory. But each time it's like you are sharpening the, you know, sharpening your pencil. You're getting better and better at knowing what's really going on. And you're throwing out more and more of the wrong things. So, so I think it's about being smug. Like I, like the whole point about science is that it is open-minded, changes its mind. It is flexible and, and no other method is behaves in that way and no other method is as successful as science is zachary fluke hey fraser one of your dedicated patrons here i'm thinking about a question that will probably help a lot of newcomers to the subject if an astronomical event or a type 3 civilization destroyed the andromeda galaxy in an instant would we still see it intact for another 2.54 million years yeah so instead of a type 3 civilization destroying andromeda that would be bad um but let's say there was a supernova that went off in andromeda and we so if it went off right now in andromeda then we wouldn't see it happen for two and a half million years because andromeda is two and a half million light years away from us or if we look up at the night sky and we see a supernova go off in andromeda which would be awesome i would love to see that then that means that that supernova actually went off two and a half million years ago. Whenever you look out into space, you are seeing this bubble, the sphere of backwards, right? And so we're seeing the sun as it looked eight minutes ago. We're seeing Pluto as it looked 
hours ago, we're seeing Alpha Centauri as it looked years ago, and we're seeing Andromeda two and a half million years ago. And that is, that is both sort of the curse of astronomy, that you can't see what's going on right now, but also its amazing advantage, which is that we can look out to see backwards in time as we explore the outreaches of the universe. And if we want to understand at different ages, we just looked farther or closer out into the universe. Mr. Villabolo, why use regolith for crops when you can have aeroponics with minimal water usage? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've talked about this idea of like, can we grow plants in lunar regolith, which is, you know, crushed up lunar debris? Can we grow plants in Martian regolith, you know, crushed up Mars rock that's been weathered by wind? And the answer is probably, but, but I think your point is exactly right, which is it doesn't really matter because there are a bunch of other techniques to be able to grow plants. There's aeroponics, there's hydroponics that, you know, you can just grow and there's other ones in between where you can like grow plants in these strange gel substrates and things like that. The reason we grow plants here on earth in the ground is because it's very simple. We, there's dirt everywhere and it's got mixed in organic material that is left over from hundreds and thousands of years of growth and decay. And that is just not a thing that you're going to have on Mars or the moon. And so you're going to have to create the perfect growing environment. It may very well be that that you don't need don't bother with the with the regolith, just grow it in water with nutrients added to it or grow it in the air. And actually, NASA is one of the best groups that are working on this. They do a ton of work in hydroponics. They've got hydroponic systems that are on the International Space Station right now, growing various kinds of lettuces and things like that. So like all of these these concepts that need to be figured out as we move into the into the future of space exploration, figuring out how to grow food on a sustainable basis is something that a lot of people are going to have to practice and test out different techniques and work their way towards the ones that seem to be the best, the right kind of crop, the right kind of temperature, the right kind of environment, the right kind of water, the nutrient mix, how do you deal with diseases, things like that over the long term. And it is a just one piece of this enormous list of complex Oh, enormous list of comments. There goes my question. It's going to be complicated. All right. Where'd my question go? Vincent Paolo. I love your videos. Between you and Isaac Arthur, you've ruined Netflix sci-fi alien shows for me. I'm like, if the aliens can cross the interstellar void, they don't need land to kill all humans with laser guns. Keep up the good work. Yeah, I do feel like a bit of a buzzkill <laughs> when we make these videos as we talk about science just our understanding of the universe and, and our sort of speculation on aliens and things like that, and then compare that to science fiction. Uh, science fiction, on the one hand, like I think about how much Star Trek and things like that have inspired us to move, to go into the sciences and develop a lot of these technologies. You know, if you listen to a lot of people who work at NASA, many of them were inspired by science fiction. And then at the same time, science fiction does a really bad job of kind of predicting what the future is, is going to be. And when you think of when you actually understand the physics involved and the complexities, there's a lot of these things that are they're hand waved in science fiction that are actually right now we have no idea how this would be possible. Things like artificial gravity. You, know, you have a spaceship like Enterprise or whatever and it's got this artificial gravity and, and that is just that's the thing that you assume so that everyone doesn't have to float around the spaceship and it's very complicated. When a sci-fi show like, say, The Expanse takes this on, then they're able to, uh, th you can see how they have, it's complicated and they have to deal with it. And if they do a good job of it, like The Expanse really did, then you can see how more accurately how the future of that will work. And yet at the same time, The Expanse has this incredible fusion drive system that I can't imagine how we would ever have anything that's that powerful. So, so I think that, you know, as you watch more and more science fiction and as you understand more and more about just like realistically what's going on with the state of space science, you kind of hold those two in, in your brain. I think you're okay then. You don't have to have it ruined for you. It's just a great story and you can enjoy it. And then at the same time, appreciate when someone has taken the time to do a really careful and good job and really adhere to the, to the science. So I apologize for uh for being buzz killington but uh that's kind of my job that's why keep me around that's me why is it sometimes better to use a ground-based telescope rather than a space-based telescope all things being equal 
there is really only one reason to use a ground-based telescope over a space-based telescope, and that is that your ground-based telescope is on the ground. That you can go over to it and you can fix it, you can put a new instrument on board, you can realign the optics. I mean, think about what happened with the Hubble Space Telescope, how it had this flaw in its optics and they had to launch an entirely new mission up to put in corrective optics to be able to get proper resolution images out of the Hubble Space Telescope. If that was a problem here on Earth, they would have been able to take the telescope down for a couple of days, put in the new optics, and and they would have been back in business. So that is the thing, is that it is so much easier to deal with ground-based telescopes here. Everything else, when you think about in space, you don't have to deal with gravity, so you don't have to deal with that sort of deforming your, your optics, you don't have to deal with the atmosphere, the temperature changes of, of the atmosphere, you don't have to deal with temperature changes of space, but you don't have to deal with the atmosphere coming, you don't have to deal with dew on your sensors and things like that, the way amateur astronomers have to deal with, so space is such a better place. And Hubble Space Telescope is only a 2.6 meter telescope. And yet it produces these images of, of unmatched clarity when you compare that to these 10 and 12 meter telescopes that are that are available now. So it really is that that if you can have your telescope in space, but because they're hard to deal with, hard to fix, you want them on the ground. Chris Young. So the moon is basically a giant asbestos ball. That's based on the conversation we're talking about, about what the lunar regolith is. And this is one of the big challenges of exploring the moon, is that because there's no weathering on the moon, micrometeorites have been slamming into the moon for millions and billions of years and pounding the surface, the, the lunar lava rock, into this powder. But the powder, if you look at it under a microscope, it is tiny, jagged, sharp, like pieces of glass. And asbestos is a great example. So when the astronauts who did the, the moon missions were out onto the surface of the moon and they came back inside, this stuff got everywhere and was giving them uh, like cold-like symptoms. They were stuffy nose and, and you can imagine that over time, this stuff would be a really bad, you know, would be really bad news. And as talking about the thing about like how do we grow crops how do we deal with this lunar regolith do we minimize the chance that we ever even get any of that stuff inside the the lunar colony do we um have some way of cleaning it i know in artemis andy weir talks about these really high power blowers that you stand in and it's like an air shower that that cleans you off this is going to be one of those engineering challenges get it wrong and people will get sick and so just shows you how many details there are to be able to survive. Now, don't worry about Mars because the wind on Mars, it has erosion and so it doesn't have that same kind of risk as the moon dust. Thermophile, what would you launch on the Falcon Heavy? Also, what do you think the BFR will change the most about the space industry if it works as advertised? I think I'd put Elon Musk's personal Tesla Roadster on the top of the Falcon Heavy and, and launch it. Uh, no, I. Man, uh, when you think about the launch cost of the Falcon Heavy and the capacity of this, this rocket, there's a lot of things. But the thing that I would like to see most, and this is one of SpaceX's plans, is to launch this constellation of, of internet satellites around the world. And so their plan is to launch something like 4,500 satellites that are going to be able to provide gigabit speed internet to everyone on earth wherever you are and right now man my mobile phone like my my mobile phone service is terrible i have a broadband connection which is pretty good but wouldn't it be amazing to be able to be anywhere to be on the road to be in a car to be in an rv to go traveling backpacking and be able to have this super high speed connection to the internet from anywhere on the planet that is a thing that i would love to have happen in the in the future and i think that's one of the first priorities and now since spacex is going to own the launch facility and it's going to be fairly inexpensive to do it this is a thing that i think we'll see them roll out in the next couple of years and even if they don't someone else will i think we're going to see the mobile phone providers lose their stranglehold and it'll move to satellite providers i hope and then what do i think about the bfr 
well, the BFR takes space exploration to a whole other level that the costs for launching things on the BFR will be so low. The capabilities like this thing is going to be able to go to the moon and back that both the top and the bottom are going to be um, reusable and be able to lawn, land near the launch pad and be refueled. We don't know how this is going to, this is going to change everything. We don't know. It's one of those situations. Like what do you, what, where would you go? How would you travel if the price of traveling dropped by a factor of 10 within a decade? It just, it just changes. What if, think about things in your life. What if they were one tenth the price than they are today? The only comparison that we've seen is what happens with computers. Computers are the kind of thing that have gotten 10 times more powerful, 100 times more powerful. We've never seen that in, in, in sort of rocketry to this point. And so it's really a matter of like, I have no idea what's going to happen. I'm really excited. We're mining space, space based power systems, exploration, colonization, the mind boggles. American Hindi. Fraser, in all the years of watching YouTube and reading your articles, I've never heard anything about if Mars is still geologically active or not, meaning volcanoes, magma, tectonic plates, earthquakes, tremors, geysers, etc. Please make a video. I will make a video, but I'm going to make the video after NASA's InSight lander makes its way to Mars. It's going to be launching in May 2018, and we'll get. It's going to take the usual nine to twelve months to get to Mars, and then it's going to land, and its job is to answer this question. So it's going to be on the surface of Mars. It's going to be sensing tremors and sort of what kind of volcanic activity is going on under the surface of Mars. It's even going to be able to detect meteorite impacts hitting the ground nearby to kind of get a sense of, of how much the surface of Mars is getting struck. So it's going to be the perfect instrument to, to answer this exact question. And it is still kind of an unknown. We don't really know just how volcanically active Mars is. We know that it's much smaller. It cooled off a lot more quickly. It doesn't have that global uh, magnetosphere the way Earth does. But you know, geologists still don't know exactly how active, say, Olympus Mons and these other big volcanoes are. It's possible that they were still erupting tens of millions of years ago, or maybe they died hundreds of millions of years ago. These are still questions that need to be answered. And so Insight is going to help answer those questions. And once some of the first results come out of Insight, then I will totally do a video and have a lot more information to be able to provide. It kind of relates to the first question that we had in this QA. Master Pack. Is it annoying that even the slightest bit of poor quality, even anecdotal evidence will convince people that aliens exist, yet real hard facts, photographic proof, and several real organizations devoted to it can't convince people that space travel is real. People will only believe whatever is in line with their own opinions. I think it's super important to realize that that, that kind of like conspiracy thinking is, is very common and is the kind of thing that we can all be subject to. We all have things that we believe to be true or things that we know to be true and and then and then we look around the world and we fit the pieces of evidence into this frame this model of the way the world works and then and then reject other kinds of evidence and so when you meet a person who for example believes in ufos but doesn't believe in various space missions, they have constructed this worldview, this belief system that they are then perceiving the world through. And the thing that's really interesting, this kind of conspiracy belief, is that it's not necessarily, you know, it's not dumb people. In fact, in many cases, very intelligent people have a way to think themselves into a way of looking at the world that that can have problems. So. I think it's important when you encounter people like that, like as long as they're not jerks about it, to engage in conversations with them and just help, just to understand, right? What are the lines of evidence that lead you to believe this thing that you believe? What are the reasons why you don't believe these other things? And to have that conversation with people and just to understand and to remember that in each one of us, we can have a set of beliefs. We can have conspiracy thinking that that we think is perfectly rational while other people might think is think is crazy. I highly recommend if you haven't already listened, listen to the skeptics guide to the universe. One of my favorite podcasts, good friends, and they cover this week after week after week. And this is a theme that comes up a lot is, is that we are all, uh, it's all possible for us to fall victim to various levels of conspiracy thinking and that we have to always examine our own thought process as we're seeing the world to say, 
is this thing that I'm thinking? Is this thing that I'm seeing? Am I, am I, do I have incorrect assumptions that is, that is leading me through this? And that is a way that you can keep your, your mind open to new possibilities and be able to sort of use the scientific method on your own thoughts and ask yourself like, how could I be wrong here? And it's, it's so, so anyway, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know how people can believe things that are wrong and yet, you know, we, we all seem to do it. So there you go. I don't know. It's human. Eric Thatcher, how hard would it be to see if Venus had bacteria in its cloud covers? This is a, this is an idea uh, that you could have, say, this layer on Venus that's very high up where bacteria could be existing in the cloud tops and sort of floating around the, the, the Venusian cloud layer. And there's, there's some thinking that something like that exists here on Earth, very, very high altitude uh, bacteria could remain aloft and, and survive somehow. And there was this story, although I think it's been fairly debunked, that maybe bacteria was found on the outside of the space station. The Russians had found some kind of bacteria on the outside of the space station. And so maybe this high altitude bacteria had gotten from the top of the atmosphere, you know, and some of it had collected on the space station, like, like bugs hitting the front of a, of a car as it's driving. But it's not very conclusive right now. So maybe there's life that's that exists in the, in the high levels of the atmosphere, and maybe this would exist on on Venus. You, you know, the really cool thing about Venus is that if you get up to a high enough altitude, the the atmospheric pressure and the temperature is roughly the temperature you could have on Earth. And just air, our breathable atmosphere, is a lifting gas on Venus. So you can imagine some future mission that is balloons in the upper cloud tops of Venus that float around and are taking samples of this upper atmosphere. Most likely they won't find bacteria, but, but maybe. The problem with Venus is that it's very, it's very dry. The, all of the hydrogen, all the water that was in the atmosphere was blasted out into space a long time ago. But there is still some there, so maybe there could be life forms that exist very high up on the cloud tops. It's very speculative and we need to send a mission to check and find out and see what we can see. Woeful Zeus. Why all the interest in Europa? I know there might be oceans, but doesn't Ganymede also have possible subsurface oceans and a lot less radiation than Europa? The thing that, that planetary scientists are discovering now is that there are, it really looks like there are these subsurface oceans on many of the bodies in the solar system from, you know, obviously Europa and Enceladus, but also Ganymede and uh, Callisto, which are other moons of Jupiter, and maybe some of the other ones of Saturn, and maybe uh, Triton going around Neptune, and maybe even Pluto, and maybe even Eris. Like, it's, it, you know, there could be these icy worlds everywhere. The key is, is that Europa, because it's closer into Jupiter and it experiences this tidal flexing, it has a lot more recent activity on its surface. There have been seen these geysers, while these geysers haven't been detected over on, on Ganymede yet. So it just feels like Europa is, is the best place to start looking. And always, when you have these kinds of searches, you start with the easiest thing to look at first, the place where the, the planet is fairly close, Jupiter is fairly close to, to Earth compared to to Saturn, which is which is farther, where the world is experiencing the most activity, and we can see that there are these geysers of water ice going out into space that would be easier to sample. The radiation environment at Europa is a big deal; it's a big problem, and this is but this has been sort of dealt with by the mission plan for the Europa Clipper, and that it's going to stay most of its time far out. It's going to make these close passes and then go back out. And it may very well be that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, there's going to be one of these at all of the Jovi moons and try to figure out what's the difference and how can we know what is a subsurface ocean and how deep. So that's why I think they're starting with Europa. It just feels like it's the most obvious place to look first. We're so far into the, you know, we've just begun searching for this kind of thing, just understanding this is out there. I know it feels like a lifetime in internet years, but from the mind of planetary scientists, they are just getting started. You know, they only just found out about it in 1981. So, so give them some time. All right. Thanks everyone for asking all your questions. It's a lot of fun. I look forward to them every week. As always, wherever you are on the channel, if you got a question in your brain, just type it in the, in the chat. I will gather them all up and I will answer them all here. And just a reminder, I do a weekly newsletter where I gathered together all of the space news, some of the stuff that we were on on Universe Today, and some of the stuff that just is too much to, to handle, and even other reporting that I think people are doing a really good job of. 
So go to universetoday.com slash newsletter and you can sign up. And then of course you can unsubscribe anytime you want. So check it out. All right, we'll see you next week.